now we're just down. We live in the Los Angeles area, so we just went down to Orange County where my son, Axel, who's 15 now, he's a quarterback. So he went to this quarterback camp, and that quarterback camp is led by, you know, one of the top, if not the top, quarterback coach coaches in, in the world. He coaches, you know, a good majority of the NFL quarterbacks, of the college quarterbacks. So if you watched any games this weekend or last weekend, you were looking at his quarterbacks in action. Well, you know, this is my 15-year-old son working with him along with, you know, several other campers, quarterbacks. And some of the campers were younger than 15 and some were older. But the quarterback coach asked them this, and this, this has everything to do with what we're doing here today. The, 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 the coach who's so high in, I, you, it's so important what he's doing. He asked these young quarterbacks, what do you think the most important element is to playing quarterback? Like, what is the element that is most important to you being a successful quarterback? So a lot of these guys, I'm trying to get this. Yeah, just pull it up with the bar. I know, but it's kind of falling over. Yeah, do it with the arm. Don't worry about that part. Like this? Yeah, there you go. Like that? Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, I'm closer. So he asked the question, what's the most important element? Kids are raising their hand. What makes you the most successful quarterback? People are raising their hand going, a strong arm, uh, leadership abilities. Uh, another kid raises his hand uh, to be tall, uh, to make good decisions. All these, which are great answers, right, for these kids. Do you know what the answer was? Here's the answer. What's the most important element of a quarterback being successful? Trustworthiness. Trustworthiness. How to be trusted, right, in a world that is that doesn't trust anymore. Our world does not trust anymore. So now let's think about this back on the football field for a second, then we'll come back to us and our businesses. So my son learns this, right? He's only 15. I wish I learned it then too. I probably did. Didn't know it. Your all of the teammates, all the people in Axel's huddles have to trust him that they're going to win. They have to trust him that he's going to throw them the ball and hand them the ball and make the correct decisions for their team to win. Who else needs to trust the quarterback? The coaching staff has to coach, has to trust the quarterback. So whoever has the most trust gets to be the starting quarterback. Ownership in the pros, it's owned by an owner, a very rich person. They have to trust that quarterback to pay them all that money. The city, say it's the quarterback in Pittsburgh, the city of Pittsburgh has to trust that quarterback. That's who gets the job. The state of Pennsylvania has to trust that quarterback. That's, that's who pays for that quarterback. They come and they buy tickets not to see uh, other positions. They pay a, a, a big expensive ticket to see the quarterback. The referees, the officials of the game have to trust the quarterback that he's going to keep his guys in line, playing the game fairly, playing the game within the rules, okay? That is a complex leadership position, maybe the most complex leadership position there is on the planet today. This position called quarterback. Now, let's go back to yours and my business. You and me, uh, we own small businesses. Most of us are entrepreneurs, right? We work for ourselves, right? We are the quarterback of our business. We are the quarterback of our company. So all our employees, all of our team has got to trust us in an untrustworthy world. We are the quarterbacks of our lives. This particular quarterback coach who works with my son calls it, quarter, he calls it QB 360, meaning you're a quarterback 24 hours a day, 360 degrees of your life, you're the quarterback. So Yesterday, when he was coaching Axel, he, he, he said, how many of you guys, of you young quarterbacks, 
How many of you guys have witnessed somebody being bullied at school? Like a kid who's being bullied at school. And he goes, how many, how many of those kids who are being bullied can use uh, a good friend who's also the quarterback of the school on their side? Because all a quarterback has to do to the guy who's to the person who's bullying the other person is say, hey man, not cool, dude, knock it off. That's true leadership. That's held accountable. I always say this, you know, it's funny, but uh, when my son played his first season of football, he was 14, right? So this was just a couple of months ago. He was a 14-year-old freshman quarterback on a football team in high school. And you know that he was held to a higher account at 14. Uh, he was held to a higher account than our leaders are today. Isn't that weird? Why do you suppose that is? He's 14. The, the, somebody on the team messes up. Guess who the coach goes to if somebody messes up? They go to the quarterback. They go to Axel. They go, Axel, whose fault is it that that receiver dropped the ball? Whose fault is that? And Axel goes, you know, just like a 14-year-old would, oh, it's his fault. And the coach goes, no, it's your fault. That's your responsibility. And then he goes, what if the receiver runs the wrong pattern? And Axel goes, oh, that's his coach, the receiver's coach. That's his problem. And the coach goes, no, it's not his problem. That's your problem. That's your responsibility. Quarterbacks are responsible for everybody. Is this making sense to your company, to your team? Does it make sense to your household, at your, in your family household? Does it make sense at your church? Does it make sense in your neighborhood? Does it make sense in your community? Does it make sense to every party you go to, every, every event you go to? You're the leader, right? What does the leader have to have? You're the QB. You have to be trustworthy in a world that will not have it, okay? So let's just use some examples, you know, in our lives. And this is, this is the magic of what we're going to do here with the special announcement that I'm going to give to you. Because we're going to handle this thing. We're going to handle this trustworthy thing. So Gallup does a poll every year, right? And they've done this poll since 1974. Now, the last time I saw this poll, it was actually two years ago before the pandemic began. And uh, back in 1974, two thirds of the people trusted their neighbor. Imagine this. This is a Gallup poll. Two thirds of Americans trusted the person they share a back fence with. Now it's less than one third. This was two years ago. What do you think it is now? Now that we've had a pandemic for two years and everybody's confused and no one knows the truth and no one, do you think the trust level has gone up in the world? Or do you think the trust level has gone down in the world in the last two years? I think we can all agree uh, which direction it has headed especially when a 14 year old is held to a higher standard than our leaders. Quarterbacks are held to a higher standard. You and me are going to be just, we're going to be QBs, right? And here's how we're going to do it. We have to tell our story. We have to tell our story. What is the best way? What is the best way to rebuild trust that has been eroded over time. What is the number one way to build trust and build it immediately? Tell your story. That's what. Tell your story. It almost sounds counterintuitive, right? The minute you start to tell your story, everyone begins to trust you because you're exposing th certain things about yourself inside of the story, right? So some of you have been around me for a while, right? You know this, right? We're going to go deeper and deeper and deeper in the storytelling element so that you're the most trustworthy person, just like these quarterbacks. So people trust you, they pay you, they follow you. Do you ever notice how you're not trusting the media? These days, like every time they say something, you're going, I don't know if that's true. And what if a politician is is talking to you uh, while standing behind a podium? Do you believe them? 
Do you remember a time when you did believe them? Do you remember a time when you did believe uh, somebody in a white coat telling you about your health situation? And what do you what do you think about people in white coats now? What are you thinking about them? Are you go are you trusting them? Or are you questioning whether they're trustworthy or not? That's that's the bad news, right? That that might sound depressing to a lot of people, right? I start licking my chops when I hear this news. When I hear that trust is at its lowest level it's ever been, according to Gallup, and I believe it because I feel it in myself, I start licking my chops because who can restore the distrust? Us, us, the storyteller. But we have to choose the right story. We have to know how to tell it. So here's what's working. Here's what's working, guys out there. Here's what's not working. I'll tell you this first. People who don't take risks don't get any trust. Telling your story, telling your personal story is risky because you're exposing certain things about yourself that make you vulnerable. Well, that's what human beings are attracted to. Do you know that? They're attracted to vulnerability. They're attracted to seeing struggle. That's why every movie that you've ever loved and ever seen starts at the bottom of the mountain and ends at the top of the mountain. So when you and me are telling our personal story, we begin at the bottom of the mountain. It's a struggle. It's hard. That's what people are attracted to. It makes you vulnerable. The problem with the media, the problem with politicians, the problem with ineffective speakers that you know is that they don't tell stories so no one knows how to follow them because nobody truly trust them because there's no risk. There's no risk in giving data. There's no risk in not sharing yourself. I mean, it's just not, it's not risky. It's got, you've got to put your ass on the line for people to follow you. That's what I'm going to teach you how to do, right? That's what's not working, that, that no risk. What is working and start to notice this as we talk about this, you're going to begin to notice this all around you. People who are courageous, because courage is always rewarded, if you notice. Through time, courage is rewarded. So if somebody gets in front of you, and it's just as simple as I did this morning, just now, you know, a, two, a few minutes ago, I, I just started kind of with a story. And it was small, and it was seemingly undramatic, but it was a story about Don and I going down and watching my son participate in this quarterback camp. And what we learned there, but more importantly, what my son learned at the age of 15, that he can now carry on for the rest of his life and have the trust of the people around him. Because what we need in this world are leaders. And it, it feels like leadership has disappeared because they're just not brave enough to share their story for us to connect to them and then follow them. Well, I expose the fact that we do that and my son gets to learn that and he's going to struggle with it probably for the rest of his life, but eventually he will learn it. So I'm always sharing the ups and downs of my life personally so that my audience, you, that you and me have connective tissue now. And now we have some trust in a world that will not trust. Um, Dawn's going to fire off some questions at me. If you've got more, um, we'll, we'll try to answer on this live with the limited time that we have as many of these questions as we can, but that's the state of our nation. That's the state of the world right now. Trust at its lowest level. Who will be the one? Is it you? Who will be? It's going to, I know I'm going to be one of them. So you might as well come with me. Who's going to be the one who's going to restore the trust, the storyteller. Because people have built up armor to protect themselves from misinformation from from lies from uh people they don't trust anymore so we're all got this armor up like this well as soon as you start telling your story guess what happens to the armor it slowly and by slowly i mean like within a minute dissipates and just falls away and now their heart is open to you now you are the leader now they're going to follow you the question is after that is 
how good are you going to get? I'm constantly working on story because I know it's the key to the kingdom for the rest of our life as far as leadership muscles go. Those of you who have already come, right? And you're, you know what we do? You know what, the, what we do at the Bo Eason deal? You know what I do with my kids? He's going to be the one who somehow gained the most trust from his team, from his coaches, from ownership, from the fan base and from the country and the world. That's the one who wins. I want to be that guy. I want to be that gal. Okay. That's what I'm going to train you at. Sweetheart, what do we got? Questions? Yeah. Hey, everybody. Should I pretend to say hi? Yeah. Say hi. Hi. Woo. There's Dawn. Um, okay. So let's see. It could have been getting dumped at the prom. It could have been getting cut from the choir or the basketball team. It could have been when your mom told you never to sing again because you're the worst singer ever. It could be that it always comes from struggle. It always comes from pain. And I'll give you all a little tip before we get to February 1st. Look between the ages of nine and 12. That's a tip. Look between the ages of nine and 12. Those are, those are, were, it were very emotional at that time. Very emotional. And everything means the world to us. Look in that time frame. Okay, and, babe, and what else? Jen's saying, do you match it to your client journey? So like, well, I mean, yes. We, what about when we're looking at your keynotes and we have, you know, you've all your, a great, a great tip is you can put all your stories on little um, note cards, like little yes. index cards. Yeah. And you do like a lot of times when Bo, Bo and I are together at a, an event where he's speaking as the keynote, we sit there and say, okay, who's in the audience? Um, what do they need to hear? How can we get them immediately connected? What's their background, right? There's a lot of questions. Yeah, there's we, there's yeah. that, but I want to warn Jen about something also, okay. Ben, is just about the cuffs and the collars don't actually have to match up perfectly, right? A lot of my stories come from sports, right? But I don't teach people about sports. I teach people story and how to be world-class, how to be the best in the world. I don't teach them how to play a position. I teach them what will help them. So you, you're in the same boat, Jen. Your story doesn't have to match what actually they do, but it's good. Dawn and I always know what our audiences do for a living. We know what kind of audience they are. Therefore, we pick from about three or four stories, we just choose the one that kind of fits the mold of them as best we can. But we never try to act like, like say I'm, I'm speaking in front of a medical uh, uh, doctors. I don't try to pretend to teach them about being a medical doctor. And I don't try to line my story up with being a doctor. I don't. I'll still use a football story. I'll still use a story that happened to me as a kid growing up because doctors are actually human beings too. That's the beauty of it. You know, no matter what occupation you're speaking to, we always think, well, they're doctors and they're financial advisors and they're coaches. They get it because in the end, they're all human beings, just like you and me. And they're going to, once you tell your story, they're going to connect to the humanness of you. Okay. So I'll warn you about that. All right, Jen, I hope that answers it. What else do we have, babe? Yeah, we have a question here from uh, Chuck Bolton. And he says, in addition to the who I am story, what additional stories do you recommend that A-level leaders dig for, write, and tell? So like addition, like in addition to your defining moment, you know, who are you? What do you, what are you made of? Like what other stories do you recommend people sharing? Yeah. Well, your defining moment is really the key to the kingdom. Um, I don't want to confuse you guys right now, but I will tell you this. These defining moment stories are the most powerful. The, the thing that defined who you are. And everyone thinks they only have one defining moment, but you actually have them throughout your life, right? Like I had one at nine, right? Where I drew up my 20 year plan. That's a defining moment. And then I had one when I was like, when I went to college. So I was like 18 and I went to college to bring my dream into existence. And they said, no, you can't be here. You got to go home. And so it 
It defined who I was from that point on. And then again and again, these defining moments have happened throughout my life. So I think you might be thinking that you only have one defining moment story. You actually will, I use uh, in the last 11 years, I use about two or three defining moment stories in my speeches. And those are the ones I use, right? Um, because I want your audience to feel who you actually are. I don't want you to tell them who you are. I want you to tell them the story and let them decide for themselves who you are. So if I do this, if I say, hey, uh, I'm at a birthday party, right? I'm at a birthday party and I'm throwing a ball to my son and he drops it and my son's two and a half. And I goes, Axel, don't let the ball touch the ground. And then he goes, oh yeah, dad, I forgot. And he picks it up and we play catch. I, that is a, that's three sentences I just told you. But what does that say about Bo and his family? That is a defining moment of who I am and what I stand for. Because we know that that upsets some people, which it did at this back backyard barbecue. It upset people that I said that to my son, that I held my son to such a high standard. But right when I tell that little antidote, which I just told you, what do you know about me? What do you know about me when I say to a two-year-old, don't let the ball touch the ground? What do you know about me? Uh-oh, okay, this dude is serious. I'm going to be held to a high standard. I am going to be held to account more than the leaders of our country are. That's what happens when I'm with Bo. That's what I want them to feel from you. That's a defining moment story that lets people, just by you telling the story, it makes them trust you and go, you know what? If I want high standards, I'm going to hang around Bo. If I hate high standards, I'm not going to be around Bo because that's going to be abusive relationship, right? That's why the story is so key. And you can use these, which I've used them for 11 years. You're going to use these for the rest of your life. And you're going to build your company based on these stories. All right, babe, what else? Yeah, it looks like I have a question. I, you know what? We had a... Um... A great question from Michael Fishman, but Michael I, think, Fishman. I, 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 love, I love Michael Fishman. I think he, I think you just answered it, um, but I'll just repeat it. It says the best storytellers serve as a mirror for those listening to them. As I learn about you, I locate my own life in that message. How does a storyteller enable that? And I feel like you just shared that. Yeah, right? hey, Michael is exactly right. Like he speaks better than me and he writes obviously better than me and he's able to capture this energy that I'm talking about, Michael. I mean, that's what he does for a living. He's like the best, right? So he, he, he can, and, and then he takes what, you know, he just takes this concept and this emotion and this human connection and he's able to put it in a sentence like he just did, right? And you're going to be able to do that too uh, by telling your story. All right. And then we have uh, one here from Derek Nelson. He says, hey, Bo. What's up, Derek? I'm curious, did you realize that your defining moment was happening in the moment or did you look back on it later and see that it defined you more than you realized? Yeah, I, I, I never can. I'm blind to it as I'm walking through it. So it's it usually comes from looking backwards, right? And you go, wow, I became this because of that. Often you'll hear rock and roll stars, like great singers, like world-class singers. You'll hear the same story from them. Oh, I was in the back seat of the car. All the kids were singing. The whole family was singing. And my mom or my dad turned around to me and said, you know what, sweetheart? You're the worst singer in the family. So here's what's going to happen. Don't sing anymore. Let your brothers and sisters sing. You're not good at it. Typically, that is the person who becomes a star singer. <laughs> Our, our, our defining moments are always from pain. When they told me I couldn't play pro football, that was a, the most pain that I ever faced in my life. So what do you suppose I did with that information? I turned myself into a pro football player. And if you notice the most elite athletes on the planet, be it Michael Phelps or Michael Jordan or uh, Simone Biles, they were told they couldn't. 
They were cut from their high school basketball team. They were told they would never amount to anything. And those are the people that right in that moment, they get defined. The world has just defined them. And they said, I will not stand for this definition. This game or this singing episode I had will not define me. I will prove it. I will show the world. I will train my ass off because now I've got emotional investment. That's why defining moment stories are so good because everybody connects to them because everybody's had the same kind of pain. Yeah, I have, a, I have a great question about that too from John. He says, I am an amputee, but I don't identify as broken. So many times when I tell my story, it just, pe it just brings people to broken. How do I focus my traumatic story to make it relatable and not scare people with their own imagination? Yeah, so this is so good. This is, what's his first name? Uh, uh, hold on, I just moved, John. John, John. Um, it's so funny, not funny, but it's just so profound. <sighs> because you're an amputee, that goes a long way in storytelling because it's a physical thing. And I'm not sure in your case, if it's like apparent all the time or as if it's covered up or whatever, the, the, the prosthetic or whatever you have. But it tells so much of the story that you verbally don't have to tell, right? And most people um, who have had cancer or have lost a parent who, or have lost a limb, they tell the story as if they're a victim of something. Obviously, you're not a victim of this because there's no such th thing as victimhood in storytelling. No such thing. So when you take the stage uh, and people can see that you're an amputee, they know your story. All you have to do is fill in kind of the, the feelings and what happened and what you thought of and what you're, how that defines you. You know, how, what, what was the thought process that now changed because of that amputation, right? Same thing happens when um, somebody gets dumped at the prom. We've all been dumped, right? And it hurts, especially at a young age, it hurts. So it, it defines who you're going to be going forward. Well, being dumped actually is an amputation of the heart. So it's invisible to people. It's a, it's a sword or a spear right to the heart. So you have to tell that story. And here's the reason people will trust you because they've had the same pain. They're gonna locate themselves inside of your pain, which makes them trust you and it makes you the leader. So when you have an apparent amputation, like everyone can see it, it's actually easier to be a storyteller because people are already with you. They are with you because it is apparent that you have faced a certain kind of pain that we don't understand. And now we're going to trust you and we're going to follow you based on where you're going to take us. And the story of that amputation, so good. Look, all of us have faced amputations of one, one way or another, right? We just have. And so... Your ability to share that story buys you so much goodwill and makes people follow you. Got me, everybody? Okay. Oh my gosh. So I just love this. We have Mark Fried on. We have Angela Stillwell. We have Tammy <laughs> Lee on. I like. I oh my gosh. Me. So just. Is this, this like a reunion? Week? Reunion. We actually, you guys, we, 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 we need to have a reunion. I think LaShawn's been bugging me to have a personal story power reunion. So we will get that um, on the books. But um, Mark Free just put in the chat, hey, Bo, I was part of one of your first programs. We met in Nashville. I use my story every time I speak. I have brought in over 200 million in assets from 20 million when we first met. Great to see you are doing well. Everyone needs a story. Okay, Mark Free, what's up, dude? Um, Mark Free, by the way, such, such a smart dude. 
that Don and I used him. I remember when he was, when you were in our program, like using you as if I like, Hey Mark, what should we do here? What should we do there financially? What should, how, what should we make requests here or there? Um, look, Mark, I'm a little disappointed that it's only 200 million, right? But you know, you're doing okay, buddy. You're doing okay. Way to use your story. That's the difference. 20 million uh, before telling story, 200 million after telling story. And the, it's not just Mark Freed. It's, uh, this happens to everybody. Guess why? I told you already, it's the most valuable thing that you got, especially in this environment we're in. If you're the one who can rebuild this eroded, tr guess what you get? You get rewarded. Courage is always rewarded. So the team that trusts you, it's not all all-stars. It's not all rookies. It's a combination of the two. And that's how we go to the top. That's how you win championships. All right, babe. Any other questions? Are we good? No, we're good. We're good. Hey, everybody. Great to see you. Uh, let's get our story down. Let's gain the trust of the public and then lead them where we want to take the, where we want to take them. Because obviously, some knucklehead leader is going to lead them down a path of misinformation and no trust and no accountability. Right? Let's take them where we want them to go. Thanks, everyone.